Thank you, President Heldobler. I wish to take a moment of our time together to reflect on the celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day earlier this month and the upcoming Native American Heritage Month uh, in November. These events serve to remember and acknowledge the cost borne and the lives lost by the in Indigenous groups and the lands we now occupy, which in our area are namely the tribes collectively referred to as the Lenni Lenape. Our commitment to diversity and justice at William Patterson demands that we face these historical truths with the dignity and respect that they, they, that they de deserve. Our keynote speaker for this year's event is the founder and executive director of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, Mr. Albert Fox Kahn. As a lawyer, technologist, writer, and interfaith activist, Mr. Kahn began STOP in the belief that emerging surveillance technologies pose an unprecedented threat to civil rights and the promise of a free society. Mr. Khan is a frequent commentator on civil rights, privacy, and technology matters, and a contributor to numerous publications, including the New York Times, Boston Globe, Slate, NBC Think, and the New York Daily News. He's provided testimony to numerous organizations inside New York, including several city count council committees. In addition to his work at STOP, Mr. Khan serves on the New York Immigrant Leaders Council, the New York Immigrant Freedom Funds Advisory Council, and on the editorial board for the Anthem Ethics of Personal Data Collection. Mr. Khan received his JD cum laude from Harvard Law School and his BA in politics from philosophy from Brandeis. We are very fortunate to have Mr. Khan join us for today's event to provide some insight into a rapidly developing area of public concern. Just as a reminder, we will ho hold a question and answer period after Mr. Khan speaks. We have moderators monitoring the chat and collecting questions. So please type any questions you have into the Zoom chat and we will address them when appropriate. You can direct them to me or to Dr. Janet Ahn. Mr. Khan, I turn it over to you. Andrew, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Thank you uh, for having me uh, as a guest for this really remarkable series. And, and really, I, I, I'm so grateful for everyone who is joining to talk about what I think may be one of the most consequential matters uh, that we are seeing in surveillance policy uh, today. And that's the ways that the COVID-19 surveillance infrastructure being built up in response to the pandemic is potentially creating a new tool uh, of mass uh, police surveillance, potentially criminalizing communities of color, further expanding the power of uh, immigration enforcement, and really challenging some of our most fundamental values uh, on the topic of privacy and civil rights. Uh, let me make sure that this goes to full screen. Um, but we can't begin a discussion of anything related to COVID-19 without acknowledging the really historic cost of this pandemic. The hundreds of thousands of Americans who have already died, the millions who have been sick, the millions around the globe who have become infected. And when we talk about COVID-19 policy, it is truly a matter of life and death. And it is in the you know, face of that sort of scale of suffering, it is easy to adopt magical thinking, to want to believe in the power of some of the surveillance technologies being offered uh, as a solution. But the reality is often very different from that. And, and I want to be quite clear up front that I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, the ways that novel technologies are used for contact tracing contact tracing applications on phones and wearables. We'll be discussing uh, all sorts of new tracking solutions, but this is very different from the evidence-based contact tracing models that have been used by public health officials for decades. And when I raise concerns about contact tracing, none of this should be seen as in any way undermining the vital role that contact tracing plays in countering the pandemic, quite the opposite. This is really an effort to try to highlight the difficulties and dangers of electronic high-tech contact tracing apps and pushing back against our increasing reliance on them as a substitute for evidence-based measures. But, you know, we, we all are impacted by this virus, whether we are ill or our family members have been infected or simply we find ourselves cut off from, you know, the everyday pleasures of life, you know, cut off from family, constantly here in this liminal space on Zoom, not quite able to connect uh, or, or engage in everyday activities. But 
even despite all of that, despite the constant cost, we have to really look at the impact our decisions are having and we have to use scientific methodologies and consistent with our values and our constitution in order to respond. So when we look at the threat of mass data collection, we have ample uh, examples from our police departments, from our immigration officials, and, and countless other government agencies. Here in New York City, when we largely disbanded the practice of stop and frisk, that analog abuse was quickly replaced by digital tracking. We constructed a so-called gang database that tracked over 42,000 New Yorkers, 99% of whom are New Yorkers of color, and using that as a substitute, explicitly as a substitute for the sort of analog tracking that we had been doing through stop and frisk. We see growing dependence on facial recognition and other biometric tracking. We see automated license plate readers and social media monitoring, creating a constant map of where we go and who we connect with. And we see that information not just being weaponized by police, but we see firms like Palantir, the uh, Silicon Valley uh, data aggregation company, selling that information to immigration officials so they can algorithmically optimize the deportation efforts that are ripping families apart across this country, separating uh, parents from children, and making so many undocumented Americans live in constant fear uh, of the threat of deportation. And so data collection, data aggregation, particularly the type of data we speak about with COVID-19 contact tracing, creates real and immediate threats, if not properly safeguarded. And you would think that we would have a privacy law, like we're talking about health data, we're talking about incredibly sensitive data, and one would think that there would have to be a protection against that data being misused by police, but the reality is there, there simply is no protection. The most pr uh, commonly cited federal health privacy law, HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, it does very little to prevent our health data from being weaponized uh, by police and immigration officials. Under HIPAA, police don't even need a warrant to access our medical records. They simply need a subpoena, which means that they largely have a free hand to get a court to command us to hand over our medical records so long as we prove, so long as we can argue that it's not an undue burden. That's the standard, undue burden. If unless their request poses an undue burden, we have to hand over this data. Our doctors have to hand over this data. Public health officials have to hand over this data. But even worse, a lot of the contact tracing data that's being collected in the age of COVID-19 falls completely outside of the scope of HIPAA. HIPAA only applies to covered entities and business associates. Your doctor, your insurance company, if your company has an HR department with health records. But it doesn't apply to private software vendors that are creating these applications. In fact, many of the applications that have been developed in response to COVID-19 explicitly say that they are exempt from HIPAA. We, we saw that with Google's uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, screening application, which they developed to see if people should be tested for the virus out in, uh, uh, in uh, California, in the Bay Area. We've seen that with many of the contact tracing apps. And, and so really there's no federal privacy law. And at the state level, it's largely the same. You know, here in New York, where I'm speaking to you from, we have a bill that is uh, awaiting the governor's signature, which would be one of the first protections in the country against uh, abuse of COVID-19 contact tracing data by police. Uh, and it, but still, even though it was enacted by the legislature months ago, in the summer, the governor still hasn't yet to sign it. And in New Jersey, there's legislation that has been passed by the assembly that is still pending before the Senate. And while that would offer some privacy protections, it would do nothing to address the concerns about this data being misused by law enforcement, being misused by ICE, and being misused by other government agencies. So we really need to respond both at the state level and the federal level to, to deal with the threat of this data being misused. So 
we've been talking a lot about contact tracing. So let me just go through the mechanics a bit of how it works to emphasize why it is so important to protect this information from misuse by law enforcement. If someone has had a positive test uh, for COVID-19, a PCR test, an antigen test, that will then be reported to the state health department or to uh, in New York City to the local health officials. And then you will uh, oftentimes the individual who tests positive will get a call from a disease detective or a contact tracer who will ask for the information of anyone who that individual has been in close contact with for two days prior to their test or two days prior to when they first had symptoms. And so this is asking for a really intimate picture of our private lives. It's asking for information that can be deeply revealing. And a lot of the applications that are being developed for contact tracing go even further, can track a lot more than simply people we have been in close contact with, meaning within six feet of them for more than 10 minutes. And this creates an impossible choice under our current legal setup, because a lot of Americans, when they're being asked for the list of who they've been in contact with, they have to wonder what the ramifications are of an honest answer. When you say who you were with, what happens if you were at a, in a situation where someone's com committing a crime? What happens if you are around individuals who you know were undocumented? You either can give an honest answer, give a full answer, help fight the virus, or you can help protect your loved ones. But either way, there are really unconscionable risks. And this is the, a really a direct result of the lack of privacy protections we have right now. Imagine if someone had been in contact with a sex worker, or if they were at a restaurant where they knew that uh, uh, some of the staff were undocumented. There's so many scenarios where, give, where working with disease detectives would be providing information that would make people feel scared. And just that fear alone would be enough to, to make people refuse to fully engage with the contact tracing process. One of the most controversial examples has been questioning about participation in public demonstrations, because this would become yet another way to, mass, to engage in mass surveillance of political dissent, something which has been an all too present reality here in New York City and across the country where we've systematically targeted and tracked individuals who exercise their First Amendment rights to engage in political protests. But you know, if, if we have the proper safeguards, then this type, of, uh, this type of dilemma would be less pronounced. But we've gone in the other direction. Instead, we've used law enforcement as a central part of our response to COVID-19 using the NYPD and other local police departments uh, to fine and arrest people for non-compliance with social distancing regulations. To, to, we've seen people tackled and arrested for refusing to wear masks. And it is so important to build public uh, trust and to promote these life-saving measures. Wearing masks saves lives, social distancing saves lives. But when you turn it into a matter of criminalization, when you turn it into a law enforcement issue, you actually go in exactly the wrong direction. You undermine the uh, broad base of support we have for life-saving measures, and you end up building further distrust of the contact tracing process. In, in New York, we've seen the NYPD use drones as part of their enforcement of social distancing. We've seen uh, calls from the governor to include police and in broader task force to further criminalize uh, COVID-19 response. And we've even seen law enforcement officers in Minnesota talk about contact tracing uh, members of protests as a way to intimidate people from uh, exercising their, their First Amendment rights. And, and this to me is deeply, deeply concerning because and the only real response we can take is to start to build a firewall between police and public health officials, walling off these two arms of government, making sure that we do not give 
uh, that we don't allow this public health response to COVID-19 to be transformed into yet another policing tool. Of course, you know, when we're faced with all of these dilemmas, we've been hearing from a, a chorus of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and uh, big tech companies that there's another way, that there, we don't have to have this broad manual contact tracing effort, that we can use another approach. And, and they've told us that technology would be our salvation, but it won't. And, and I, I always want to keep the adage, beware of geeks, bearing gifts close uh, at my, close to mind at the, during this conversation, because we really have to be skeptical uh, of the claims we're hearing about the ways that technology will solve this. Because we've been down this road before where people who are selling a product will always find a way to convince themselves, to convince us, to convince government officials that their product is the solution just that's because it's what they're already selling for smartphone manufacturers that means turning their devices into yet another mass tracking tool in the hopes of fighting off COVID-19 but while we hear lots of promises and we hear lots of rhetoric and we hear lots of hope we don't see a lot of evidence that this approach actually works and what we do see is quite a bit of danger that this uh, technological approach, this techno-solutionist approach could actually build uh, an infrastructure uh, of mass police surveillance. Now, it would be a much harder question if we were asked to simply pit our values against a technology that could save lives. But you know, the thing that makes this much easier as a dilemma is the technology doesn't actually work. The technology that is being used in COVID-19 contact tracing apps isn't able to do what is needed to actually track the spread of the virus. But what it can do is accumulate a vast trove of information that can pose deep threats to every aspect of civil society. GPS, for example, is one of the most common contact tracing technologies. It was used in a number of states, including Utah, I believe, North Dakota. And as part of that initial rollout of apps, we heard a lot of eagerness to use this uh, technology built into our phones as a way to uh, engage in contact tracing. But with GPS, it's generally only precise to a distance of 22 to 42 feet. That isn't close enough to actually tell if someone has been a, a actual ex close exposure. We, we need six feet of accuracy reliably and this is an order of magnitude more. But while 22 to 42 feet can't tell you what uh, whether someone has been exposed to COVID-19, that isn't enough accuracy to contact trace reliably. It is enough precision to tell what house of worship you go to, to see if you're getting reproductive health care services, to see whether you go to a political demonstration to really monitor the expression of nearly every you know, aspect of our constitutional rights. And it really, uh, it continues to be uh, just mind boggling that this level of tracking is being seen as, as a positive, as a solution, because GPS also requires a perpetual log of every place you go, not just when you're near people who have COVID-19, but a minute by minute, second by second map of every step you take, logged in a central server, then cross-referenced with other people's paths to see if there's a potential point of overlap. It's really a level of surveillance that Orwell could not have even uh, imagined. Bluetooth has been relied by, on by a number of states, including New York and New Jersey, but it also is not able to do the job. Bluetooth is more precise than GPS, but it's not nearly precise enough to, do, to consistently see if someone is six feet away. Bluetooth, the way Bluetooth contact tracing apps work, they, they take the strength of a signal as a proxy for the distance. The stronger the signal, the closer someone is, the weaker it, the signal, the further away they are. But there are many other things that can change the strength of a Bluetooth signal. The model of phone, how recent it is, 
uh, your battery level, your operating system. If it's held in your hand, in your pants pocket, in a purse, whether you know, the materials of the building you're in can reflect Bluetooth signal and distort the proximity. And even if Bluetooth was reliably measuring distance, like every other contact tracing uh, technology, it would fail to actually gather the context that's needed to understand whether someone was truly exposed. Was someone six feet away, but on the other side of a wall? Were you six feet away and indoors, outdoors? Were you wearing PPE? Were you unmasked? None of this vital information is collected by the app just this crude statistic. You know, what a, we, we've certainly seen a broad effort by Google and Apple to promote Bluetooth in their contact tracing app. We see right now a multi-million dollar effort to promote the adoption of these technologies across the country to make themselves a vital part of our health ecosystem. But they, the, pro, the privacy promises they make don't hold up to scrutiny. And these contact tracing apps being rolled out across the country create a profound risk of logging individual's location, logging their identity, and creating a tool for mass surveillance you know, that goes beyond even what our law enforcement is capable, currently capable of. But most importantly, they never actually asked if this was something that Americans wanted. They built it first and decided to ask us later. And when they didn't like the answer they got, they decided to spend money to convince us that they were right all, wrong, all along. This is exactly backwards. And as a result, they will never build the critical mass needed to make these contact tracing apps effective. In order to have an effective contact tracing app, you need to have 60 to 80% of Americans using that app you need to have mass buy-in. But only 81% of Americans have a smartphone. But that number drops for those who are lower income, under those with uh, who make less than 30,000. Uh, the rate of smartphone ownership goes down to 71%. And most problematically, for those over 65, only 53% own a smartphone which means that lower income communities, elderly individuals, some of those Americans most at risk of dying from COVID will be left out of this public health uh, system. They'll be more at risk, they'll be invisible to the public health monitoring that's made possible by this mass surveillance, skewing our image of where to allocate resources and to invest in COVID uh, prevention. And even for those with smartphones, many will have devices that simply won't run the app, that are too old, that have the wrong over, uh, operating system where the battery is uh, can't actually support it. It's estimated that 2 billion smartphones worldwide, a majority, are unable to run these contact tracing apps that are currently being rolled out in many of our states. And We've also seen a really problematic trend of where countries have forced this sort of smartphone uh, tracking, such as in Israel, where their domestic intelligence agency used smartphone data without end user consent to track potential COVID exposure. People receive so many false alarms, so many, uh, 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 so many false positives that they ended up leaving their phones at home or putting them on the airplane mode or switching the SIM card, doing anything to avoid the tracking and the constant headache of false alerts. That sort of alert, of alert fatigue is a, will fatally undermine the value of any of the, these contact tracing apps. So what do we do instead? What do we do if the technology isn't going to save us, if Silicon Valley isn't going to save us, if we can't simply invent our way out of this with a new form of surveillance capitalism? Well, the answers are pretty low tech. We begin by listening to communities. You know, we, be, we actually start by asking if people want this sort of tracking. And we listen to the fact that, you know, currently, uh, the majority of Americans say they don't. And actually two thirds of black Americans have said they don't want this sort of tracking. Uh, 
And so instead, we use low tech measures like testing, improving access to testing across communities. Currently, America has improved our access to COVID-19 testing, but the average test takes nearly three days to come back. Three days. This is, I, according to most public health experts, we need a test result within 24 hours to be for it to be meaningful encountering the spread of COVID-19. So many Americans can't simply isolate themselves for three days waiting to find out if they're positive or not. A massive investment in testing would be uh, a hu hugely important in countering the spread of COVID-19. And in addition, we need to hand, we need to address the uh, lack of equity in testing. For Black Americans, it takes nearly four days to get a, a COVID-19 uh, test answer. And this doesn't even include the amount of time it takes to schedule a test and, and to have that, uh, that swab taken initially. And for contact tracing, we need to invest in manual contact tracing, culturally competent, community-driven contact tracing. We need to invest in neighbors talking to neighbors. We need to invest in having uh, disease detectives who are able to communicate in the full range of languages spoken in our communities. We need to make sure that we actually build the trust to, uh, to, to ensure that every time someone is you know, potentially exposed to COVID, that they know that they get tested, and if they're infected, that they get treatment and they are isolated from the community. But that sort of manual contact tracing will only work if we address the privacy threat. And that requires us to actually act and pass laws. This means signing state, that this means signing New York State's COVID-19 contact tracing bill into law. It means enacting stronger uh, protections in other states. And it means federal legislation that creates a firewall between uh, law enforcement and public health uh, data about COVID-19. We can do this. We've done this before. In the, with the United States Census during World War II, we, we saw this incredibly intimate data about nearly every American household weaponized by law enforcement. We saw FBI agents using that census data to imprison Americans of Japanese ancestry simply for their race. We saw them interned in concentration camps. And in the aftermath of that abuse, we passed a federal law to make clear that census data could never be accessed by law enforcement not with a warrant, not with a subpoena, not with any sort of court process, not under any circumstance. We built that firewall for the census because we knew that without it, we couldn't have an accurate count. And we knew that how important that count was. Now we are trying to collect data to deal with COVID-19 through contact tracing. And the only way we can actually make that a success, the only way we can actually build trust, the only way we can break down the, the suspicion that has already been created is by passing ironclad protections that make clear that COVID-19 data, that contact tracing data can never be used as a tool to arrest or deport members of our communities. I think we can do it. I, I hope we will do it, but it will require work from all of us. So thank you so much. I'm very much looking forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Albert, for a very interesting and informative presentation. I am going to turn the mic over to my colleague, Dr. Janet Ahn, to field questions from the audience. Just as a reminder, and I will post this in chat, if you would like to ask a question, you can message either Dr. Ahn, Dr. Desuma Noop, or myself if you have any questions for uh, Mr. Khan. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Gladfelter. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Khan, thank you so much for your, your address today. This was really interesting and highly relevant um, given the current times and just such a topic that's really important for all of us to engage in and, and really consider and think more about. So I really uh, thank you for that. Um, so he, we have a list of questions for you. Hopefully we have time to answer um, a lot of it, but just to jump on to what you ended with in terms of 
having strong ironclad protections around individuals and this data, uh, especially in response to how we're contact tracing for COVID. Um, so a question came up, we can wait for government to pass these laws and legislation to protect our privacy, but what can we actively do in the meantime? Um, so you mentioned listening to communities and speaking to one another, but when it's fairly difficult to kind of organize in these large ways, right, um, minus through these virtual forums, what other solutions can you um, provide um, to help us to do this in the meantime before, because like you said, in the, in the, we're, we're still waiting on something in New York from the summer, takes time. So what can we actively do today as individuals to protect our privacy and, um, and wait for these laws to be passed? Yeah, and I, I want to fully admit that, you know, when you're a lawyer, you uh, tend to see the solution to every uh, problem in legal terms. Uh, and that definitely is not the case. There are a lot of, there's a lot of work that can be done. I mean, I think with COVID-19, you know, we're talking about an array of community uh, responses. So part of it is pure public health work. It means working to educate neighbors, to promote social distancing, to help ensure mask usage, all of the things that help prevent the spread of COVID-19 because the more the outbreak continues out of, you know, unabated, the more we see it spread, the more pressure there is for the mass surveillance. And so the more effectively we push get back against the spread of COVID-19 to begin with, the less pressure there will be for these sort of dystopian tracking solutions. So that's an important part of it. Educating uh, friends and family about the, the apps and really trying to dissuade adoption of those, because I think re from my perspective, they are such a dangerous distraction from uh, actual evidence-based public health measures. And the more resistance we see to the adoption from members of the public, the more that you know, public officials will be forced to actually address the tools that we have that work, such as manual, competent, uh, culturally competent uh, contact tracing. And, and so I think those are some of the most important measures. So that, that was going to... Uh, perfect response. I was going to segue into what are those more positive ways to surveil then? Um, so if not through contact tracing, because one thing we do know is that when um, the virus hit the U.S., it hit the same time that it um, that it arrived in South Korea. And South Korea is heavily contact tracing um, their citizens and actually suppressing the virus uh, spread. So and yet there's that whole um, invasion, serious invasion of their citizens' privacy at the same time um, because their, their contact tracing is even more in depth and extensive than the ones that we're using. So what are those positive ways, right, that we can surveil um, while still protecting public um, health and privacy? So this, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll pause there before jumping onto the next one, yeah. Yeah, I think the South Korean example is really crucial because we often times are uh, asked to adopt some of the tracking methods that were used in South Korea mm -hmm. while ignoring the wide array of other responses we saw. In South Korea, we had some of the earliest adoption of mass uh, testing with wide availability of uh, testing where people would actually get responses quite quickly. That was a part of it. We saw a broader social safety net where people who were forced to stay home were getting care packages, were getting supplemental uh, support from the government, were getting financial support, that you didn't have this bind that we're creating for so many people today where they don't know how to, to keep the roof over their head and to socially distance at the same time. And we, we certainly did see that mass surveillance, but we also saw widespread access to high quality medical care without a lot of the barriers that we see in the US given our for-profit healthcare system. And, and so we, you know, the, South Korea was quite effective in responding, but we can't expect the same benefits when we adopt only that most invasive form of surveillance adopt that here and adopt none of the other things that really enable an effective medical response. Thank you so much for clarifying that. That's a really good point. Um, so what is, where is this line um, between protecting your privacy and it's like protecting public health and safety, right? Where, where is, because it gets really blurry, right? Um, so just curious what you think about that line. 
Yeah, and, and I think if I thought that giving up my privacy to save another human being's life was the trade-off, I would do it in a heartbeat. If I thought that give, being tracked every day by a phone system connected to a public health authority would stop this uh, pandemic and get us back to life as usual, I'd be the first to sign up, but it's not the choice we're being offered. And the choice we're really being offered is whether we invest in you know, proper medical care, in testing, in uh, existing proven systems like manual contact tracing, or whether we start handing over all of this data. But I think in terms of you know, privacy protections uh, in terms of that firewall between law enforcement and public health officials, I think it is completely counterproductive to turn this into a policing issue and to create all of the other uh, problems that have come when, when we uh, treat public health matters as, as policing issues. I think that a real there's potentially a parallel to the way that we treated addiction in this country for so many years as a law enforcement matter that we still do. And that has not been a way to effectively fight addiction. That, that's put a lot of people in jail, but it hasn't done much to curb the use of controlled substances. And you know, we, we have to stop this assumption that police really are our one tool for solving every, uh, every issue. Thanks so much, Mr. Khan. Um, I have a question here regarding traveling. Um, so several airlines are piloting a COVID testing program that will use cell phone technology as a COVID-19 passport documenting someone's uh, COVID test results so that they can travel more readily. Are you, firstly, before jumping into the, the second part of this question, are you aware of this type of program? Um, and if so, what are the thoughts that you have about, um, about the potential for this information to be used to limit travel um, and require COVID vac uh, vaccinations to move around and or participate in society. Yeah, there's a really um, troubling history with so-called uh, immunity passports. This goes back to the antebellum South where we, during yellow fever outbreaks, we saw people forced to carry around uh, um, proof that they previously had been exposed to the virus. And that was used as a Job criteria as a way to, uh, you know, get a higher salary if you are a free individual. But if you are a black slave, it became another commodified attribute. It was something that would be sold as, as a way to to charge a higher price. And with the World Health Organization, we've seen strong warnings against so-called immunity passports uh, or as a precondition to taking part in public life because of the ways they create. Uh, perverse incentives to potentially get exposed to COVID-19 and then show you have prior exposure and thus uh, supposed immunity, even though there isn't actually clear proof that uh, prior exposure to COVID-19 provides lasting immunity against reinfection. So um, with a lot of the um, these sort of health uh, passports, you know the proof of uh, the proof of vaccination or proof of testing that has some upside potential, but we've so far we've seen efforts to roll these out pre-vaccine, based off of the fact that someone has previously been infected, and that's what has raised a lot of alarm bells for us. Mm -hmm. So, um, sorry if, if some of the questions seem like it's jumping around a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, here's one that was just submitted. Are legislators being aggressively lobbied by Silicon Valley uh, companies developing these apps to stop enact, enact, enactment of privacy laws that could, cre that could create firewall? It's unclear how Silicon Valley has approached that particular issue. And, and you know, some of these companies you would actually think would be aligned with uh, a strong privacy protection as a way to promote adoption of their application. But so far, I haven't seen any evidence that they've been actively lobbying for or against those bills, though they uh, might be. Uh, what I have seen is just this broad-based uh, push to make technology more central to our COVID-19 uh, response, including these uh, applications in New York and New Jersey that, uh, that purport to track exposure to the virus. A and that, that's the sort of part of the health ecosystem that we're most, uh, that we're most worried about. Mm -hmm. 
And going, um, so going back a little bit um, in your talk about listening to communities, um, does your organization stop work with other activist groups or community organizations? If so, can you tell us more about um, how these partnerships operate and work? Yeah, we work deeply in partnership with community-based organizations. So coming to this work as a very privileged ally, I wanted to make sure that we were held structurally accountable to the communities we serve. And so I created a community advisory board, which uh, includes activist organizers, uh, uh, academics, attorneys from uh, over-surveilled communities that are part of our core partnership team. But um, for some of the legislation we pushed through in New York, such as the Public Oversight Surveillance Technology Act, we gathered over 100 organizations from across the country, including overwhelmingly grassroots community-based organizations, to put pressure on lawmakers to enact that law. We often work in partnership with aggressors groups to do public education work, organizing work, Educate, uh, you know, uh, advocacy work. And that's really central to how we operate uh, as an organization, constantly building coalitions. And, and then also, um, we are a member of a number of other coalitions, such as the New York Immigration Coalition, where I, I serve on their policy board and where we work with a number of the leading uh, immigrant rights groups from across New York State. Awesome. Thank you. Um, this idea of cultural competent contact tracing is so compelling. Has this model been enacted anywhere and what did it look like? Or if not, what would it look like? Yeah, we've seen it coming in bits and pieces. And so a ex good example of this is where we've seen uh, grants and micro grants to small grassroots community based organizations. So it's not a phone call from some stranger in uh, office halfway across the state, but it's someone who maybe is a member of your church or maybe is a part of the same PTA or who you have friends in common who's a part of your community who uh, is able to reach out and have that conversation about past exposure. And, and part of the cultural competence is, uh, part of why it's so important is it builds trust, it builds bridges, it makes it easier to have that conversation and actually uh, get a full accounting of anyone who's potentially exposed. But it also just uh, prevents misunderstanding about potential exposure events, mm -hmm. which we've often seen when we're dealing with, especially if we're dealing with someone who has no experience uh, in that same community or who and, and who is using a, a translation service to, to communicate. And uh, Mr. Khan, thanks so much for um, answering all these questions. I didn't want you to feel like I'm putting you on spot, but yeah. there's just so much interest um, coming in um, from your talk. And I just want to give everyone the chance to be heard. Um, but I really appreciate your answering all these questions um, in, this, in this time. Uh, so I have another question now about um, what do we do about government officials who advocate not wearing a mask or, so, or um, do not social distance? So I, I need to be clear, we are a 501c3 organization. Staff does not promote uh, the election of any candidate for public office. Speaking right. purely in my own capacity as a private individual, I, I think that the ballot box is the only tool we have to hold accountable the you know, public health, not the, the elected officials who are promoting really dangerous, misguided, and anti-scientific uh, rhetoric uh, about this pandemic. This is deadly. It really is, and there's not a legal solution. There's no law to prevent it. There's no court order you can get to prevent it. The only thing we can really do is come together as a country and, and hold those elected officials accountable and make it and and take them out of office because I, I'm terrified of how many more Americans will die needlessly if we if we don't do that. Right. Same mutually. Um, so we're, I, I, I certainly want to give you a breather um, and, and um, not uh, ask too many questions of you, but we, we just love it. Um, this time that we have with you. We'd like to just kind of squeeze out um, as much as we can, so I, given I mean, that we are. I'm a lawyer. I, I'm good with cross-examination. You, <laughs> you actually are amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, so given that we are a college campus and um, you know, in this university setting, we're curious, how do you see some of these dynamics of surveillance and firewalling um, and how some of that surveillance play out on college campus life, if, if you can speak to that? 
Yeah, it's been very concerning. We've done a number of uh, scorecards on universities for their uh, uh, contact tracing apps, and, and some of them have been very invasive. The University of Illinois, when we first reviewed their app, was combining Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, uh, GPS, and other forms of location tracking, all as part of their standard uh, campus app, so it wasn't even a segregated health app. Uh, and this created an enormous uh, risk of, um, you know, just creating, uh, collecting data that could be misused in other ways. And also without a privacy policy that really governed uh, any of that uh, information properly. And I think if you look around the world, we're one of the few countries that isn't doing this at the federal level. You know, you don't see a lot of uh, countries saying, okay, we're going to do this state by state. And you certainly don't see it being done, you know, city by city and college by college. You know, we tried to do a comparison report on contact tracing efforts in European universities, but we couldn't find enough examples of universities having to take this on instead of the public health authorities. And that's really been troubling. But at the same time, we, we do think that any of the surveillance that we accept for the duration of the pandemic is likely to become a permanent fixture of our life. Because just as we saw after 9-11, there were promises that the surveillance uh, uh, powers we gave the federal government would quickly be rolled back. They said, you know, just four years. And then after that, that became 10 years and then now 20 years. Mm -hmm. Right. They, you know, there's a real risk that, you know, if we have this pandemic for another year, another two years, and we normalize this sort of campus surveillance, it will go on in perpetuity. And, and we've already seen abuses such as, you know, in the University of Miami, where they use facial recognition to crack down on protesters, uh, where, you know, we've seen other schools using similar tactics. And, and, and to me, that sort of surveillance it, it not only is counterproductive in the public health context, it's completely antithetical to everything that a liberal arts institution, that an institution of higher learning, that a campus devoted to free thought and the, you know, is supposed to support. And I, I can't imagine coming to a school in that climate of surveillance and really feeling the, in, the ability to have the sort of open intellectual ex exchange that I so treasured from my time in uh, college and law school. That's That was an amazing response. So I, I think that was, I'm going to wrap up there, even though I am actually receiving some additional questions on the side. Would it be um, all right with you, Mr. Khan, if we copy some of these questions and email um, you directly, directly, and maybe we can somehow distribute to the attendees of the session because it just seems like everyone's so highly engaged with everything you shared and um, really responding strongly to wanting to know more. So if, if you're open to that, yeah. um, perhaps we could figure something out um, afterwards would, among the conference committees. Would be happy to. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to uh, transition back to Andy. Um, but thank you so much for this conversation and your keynote today. Really appreciate it. Thank you again for having me. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. An, for uh, moderating that discussion. It was a productive, very productive dialogue between both of you. And um, as Janet was saying, there were a lot of questions coming from the audience about the issues that you spoke to, Mr. Khan. And everyone is definitely, um, you know, this topic is very salient, obviously, to so many of us and everyone expresses a lot of interest in it. So thank you again very much for being with us today and sharing your insights. Um, before